Quran is not the product of someone's imagination. وَلَكِنْ تَصْدِيقَ الَّذِي بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ Rather, the Quran, it affirms reality. It confirms that which is present. وَتَفْصِيلَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ And the Quran provides a detailed, elaborate structure within which a person can find a meaningful existence. A human being can achieve a meaningful existence for him or herself. وَتَفْصِيلَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدًا And the Quran is guidance through and through. وَرَحْمَةً And the Quran is mercy through and through. Guidance and mercy in all situations and all circumstances. لِقَوْمِ يُؤْمِنُونَ For people who are willing to believe. For people who approach it with an open mind and an open heart, the Quran will serve as guidance and a mercy for them. وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاء We are revealing from the Qur'an that which is a cure. Shifa'un. It is a cure-all. A cure for all that which ails humanity. وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And it is a mercy for the believers. So the Qur'an, to put it in very plain, simple terms, the Qur'an is a solution to problems. One of the problems, or rather two problems, that we deal with today as Muslims, as human beings, as Muslims, as believers, and as a Muslim community and society, two problems that we deal with, one is spiritual and one is social. The spiritual problem, the supreme, the biggest of our spiritual problems that we deal with today is we struggle in maintaining a strong connection and relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the basis and the foundation of all that which is good in our lives. The social issue that we deal with today is that we, before our very eyes, as a community, as a society, and as families, we are witnessing the deterioration of the family unit. We are watching before our very eyes, we are witnessing the crumbling of the family institution, not just amongst them or their families, but even our own families. Even within our own community, the Muslim community, we are witnessing the crumbling of this institution that we call family. But the beauty of the remedy of the Qur'an, the beauty of the solution that the Qur'an provides, is that the Qur'an provides a beautiful, provides a singular solution. One beautiful, comprehensive solution that is the first step to not only remedying the spiritual problem that we have of maintaining this relationship with Allah, but also of solving the family crisis and the family issue that we are dealing with today. And that solution is the ayah that I recited before you. Ayah number 238 from Surah Al-Baqarah, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us. This is the command form, the imperative form, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us. He says, Hafilu, which comes from the root word hifz. The, the word hifz in the Arabic language means to protect something, to safeguard something, to protect and safeguard something. But then this comes from a more exaggerated form of the verb. Hafilu comes from muhafada. Wafihi mubalaga. This is the hyperbolized, the exaggerated form of that same verb. Which in what it basically translates to is very cautiously, very carefully, very diligently safeguard and protect. Safeguard and protect what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ala salawat. The next word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala utilizes here is the word ala, which is the closest equivalent to a preposition in the English language. It means over. Over or on top of something. And it's very interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this specific word to deliver a very specific meaning. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying very carefully, very cautiously watch over. Guard over. Why over something? This is imagery here in the Qur'an. Because when you have something of significant value, how do you go about arranging for the protection of that valuable item, that valuable commodity? You typically take a room or a space that is dedicated to the safekeep and to the protection of that item. It's a safe or a vault or a room. And what's, what's typically done in that scenario, in that situation is, cameras are not put at the bottom, cameras are not put on the sides. Cameras are put along the top of the wall or the ceiling so that they can look down over the item because when you watch over something, that is the best vantage point. Because then nothing can approach that item without you seeing it first. 
So there are cameras on the walls or the ceilings, uh, a ceiling of that room, watching <laughs> over that valuable <laughs> item. And those cameras are connected to monitors where around the clock somebody monitors and watches, make sure nobody who has any ill intent, somebody who has a bad intention, nobody can come near that item. That's how you protect it. When you have something that is of extreme value, value to you, like, like diamonds or rubies or a lot of money, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, very carefully, very cautiously, very diligently watch over. Just like you would watch over diamonds. Just like you would watch over the sum of your wealth. Watch over what? as salawat the prayers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphatically commanding us that the same amount of energy, time, effort, money, resources that you would put into watching over and protecting over diamonds or anything else that was of value to you, you should invest even more energy, time, and resources into watching over, safeguarding, safekeeping the prayers. Primarily why? Because this is your primary means of maintaining your relationship with Allah. If you let this slip, if you let the prayer slip, then from there it's a free fall. From there it's all downhill. This is what is that is that last connection that keeps you connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't let that go. And the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam summarizes this very well when he says that the difference, the demarcating line, the boundary between iman, belief and disbelief, is the prayer. And the leaving of the prayer can lead a person to falling onto the wrong side of that boundary. But the very interesting, and then Allah goes on to say, وَالصَّلَاةِ الْوُسْطَىٰ In the middle or the best prayer, وَقُمُوا لِلَّهِ الْقَامِدِينَ And stand for the sake of Allah alone in a state of total, complete, utter submission and humility. Now what we learn from this ayah in and of itself, the importance of watching over the prayers, that's a valuable lesson in and of itself. But, Something that we have to learn to do is to take a little bit of a closer look or to lay, take a look from a different angle at the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the Qur'an, the words of Allah are so profound and so deep that whenever you look at it from a slightly different angle, you'll learn a different lesson. Whenever you look at it at a slightly different angle, you'll learn a different lesson. You see, this is what I like to call zoomed in understanding of these words. Hafidhu ala salawah. But when you zoom out, you get a different picture. You get a different understanding. Like when you pull up a location on a GPS, on the maps. You know the brother, when he just picked me up from the airport and we were driving to the hotel, I pulled up the location on the GPS in my phone, the location of the hotel, but it zooms in. When it zooms into a location, you know where, where you're located or you know where the location is, but you don't really quite understand what you're looking at sometimes. So instinctively, what do you do right away, immediately? You click the zoom out button. When you click the zoom out button a couple of times, and it zooms out, now you can see the nearby intersection. Now you think, you might have a better idea of what you're looking at. So what do you do? You click, out zoom, you click zoom out again. And when you click it again, now it zooms out further, now you can see the freeway. Now you have a, a little bit of a better idea of what, where you're at. And then you click zoom out again, and now you can see the nearby region and area and the towns, and now you completely, exactly, fully understand what you're exactly looking at. That that zoomed in location, where that is in the big, in the great, you know what we call the bigger picture. This ayah, ayah number 238 from Surah Al-Baqarah, Hafilu ala salawat, valuable lesson, very diligently watch over the prayers. But when we zoom out a little bit, we learn something very profound. See, when we zoom out and we look at the overall passage, the ayat before it and the ayat after it, we find something very interesting. That this ayah is located smack dab in the middle of a passage, a very lengthy passage. In Surah Al-Baqarah, that is the most comprehensive discourse. It is the most comprehensive discussion in the entire Qur'an on the subject of divorce all the way back at ayah number 228. And these are not short ayat, these are long ayat from Al-Baqarah. All the way back at ayah number 228, going all the way to ayah number 244, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about divorce. And when a marriage ends, 
and why a marriage ends, and what are the procedures and the proceedings of a marriage ending, and what exactly transpires and happens as a consequence, and how do you go about in this procedure, and how can you reconcile so that maybe the marriage does not end, this family does not fall apart, this home is not ruined. Allah talks about divorce. But the question that you and I have to ask ourselves is, if the whole passage is talking about divorce, all of a sudden in the middle, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, very carefully, very cautiously watch over the prayers? What does that have to do with divorce? Because you see, when I speak, I have tangents. I'm talking on one topic and then I'll go here and then I'll go there. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have tangents. Everything in the kalam of Allah, everything in the book of Allah, every single word in the Qur'an is consistent, is divinely, precisely placed and coherent and flowing. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasize upon us to watch over and safeguard the prayers in the middle of a passage about divorce? Well, the mufassirun and the scholars, they explain to us, because a lot of times, this is first and foremost focusing on reconciliation. How to reconcile that this couple that is bickering, this husband and wife that is not getting along, this family in this home that is falling apart, that is crumbling, that is falling apart at the seams, that what the first thing they need to do in order to repair the situation, if they truly want to reconcile, they want to fix this problem, they want to bring their home back together again, the very first thing they have to do is they have to go back and take a look at their relationship with Allah. Because you see, it's a part of life. And anyone who's further on in life knows exactly what I'm talking about. The more that starts to happen in your life, you get married, you have a marriage, you have a relationship, you have a home, and then you have children, and then you have a business and a job. And the more things that begin to happen in your life, a lot of times those things begin to distract you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have less and less time for Allah. You have less time to pray, less time for the masjid, less time to read Quran, less time to make dua. Because you're busy with so many other things that are going on in your life. And so what ends up happening as a consequence of other relationships that we have in our life, we end up neglecting our relationship with Allah. And our relationship with Allah is the source of all of the blessing in our lives. That's where the barakah and the blessing in our lives comes from. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding this couple that is fighting, this family that is having issues and problems, go back and strengthen your relationship with Allah. And that primarily will happen through your salawat and your prayers, your five daily prayers. And if you go back and you fix your relationship with Allah, hopefully the dua is, the prayer is, the hope is, that that will bring barakah and interject blessing back into your other relationships as well. And that will start to move you down the road to recovering this family and this home and this relationship. That's the first and foremost lesson. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes a little bit deeper than that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is highlighting to us the, see, prayer oftentimes, the greatest tragedy probably in our times, is that prayer becomes something very ritual, very routine. We just go through the motions. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing to our attention and reminding us here, that prayer is so much more than that. It's so much more than a set of actions and a set of supplications that you just read and recite and you go through the actions. Prayer is so much more. That salah has the ability, salah is like a regimen. It's a curriculum, it's a course, it's an exercise in improving oneself. And salah makes you a better person. And salah, can, salah instills certain traits, certain qualities and characteristics within the individual that don't just make him a better person, but can actually make a person a better husband or a better wife, a better father and a better mother, a better brother and sister and family member and community member overall. Salah instills certain traits and qualities within the individual that can, that can make this person a better person, a better family member altogether. What are some of these quite, uh, qualities and traits and characteristics? I'll mention four of them today here in the khutbah. Number one, the first quality that prayer instills, trains a person in. When you dedicate and commit yourself to the five daily prayers, it trains you in four characteristics that I'll mention here. The first of those characteristics or traits or qualities is that prayer instills within the individual a sense of responsibility 
a sense of responsibility. Another word for that, another way to say that is discipline. But that tends to scare younger people, so I don't like to use that word too much. But responsibility. Because you see, five times daily prayer, how does it teach us responsibility? At Salat al-Fajr. I had a very long day yesterday. And I have a very long day ahead of me today. And when my alarm rings at 6 a.m. for Salat al-Fajr, at 6.30 a.m. for Salat al-Fajr, every bone in my body is aching. I can feel every bone in my body is aching. And every ounce of my body, every cell in my body is telling me to keep sleeping. My body still hurts from yesterday. I know I have a long day ahead of me today. I have no, I'm so exhausted and tired that my body is telling me keep sleeping. Don't get out of your nice, soft, warm, comfortable bed. But at that point in time, I drag myself out of bed, no matter how painful and difficult it may be. And I go and I make wudu. And then I perform my salat and fajr. Why? Because I'm responsible for something right now. Just like when your alarm, if your alarm clock would to work, was to ring at 7.30 a.m. so that you can be at work by 8 a.m., even if your body ached and was tired, you would drag yourself out of bed. Why? Because that's my responsibility. Similarly, Salat al-Fajr is my responsibility at that time. And so I drag myself out of bed. I put my sleep and my rest aside. I go against what my body is telling me to do. Why? Because I'm responsible for something right now. Salat al-Fajr. Salat al-Dhuhr. Jumu'ah is a great example of that. It's when your day is at its peak. There's so much going on, you haven't even had time to eat sit down and eat properly. And there's 10 phone calls and 10 emails and 10 customers lined up. And there's so much to do. But what do you do at that time? You put everything aside. And you go to take care of your responsibility, Salat al dhuhr Salat al-Asr. Asr prayer. When you're trying to wrap up your day, and you're trying to finish up everything that's on your desk, that's on your table, that's on your agenda, your to-do list, so that you can pack up everything and you can beat the afternoon traffic back home. Friday afternoon traffic. You can beat that traffic home. But not before I take care of my responsibility, Salat al-Asr. Salat al maghrib when you get home and you're tired and you're hungry and you're exhausted and you're cranky. The only thing you want to do, you don't even feel like talking to somebody at that time. The only thing you feel like doing is taking off your shoes, putting your feet up, you know, eating or drinking something and turning on the television. That's the only thing you feel like doing. But not before I take care of my responsibility. Salat al-Maghrib, the Maghrib prayer. <laughs> Salat al-Isha, when the only thing you're physically capable of doing at that time is going to sleep. Everywhere you sit down, you doze off. But not before I take care of my responsibility, Salat al-Isha. Salat teaches us responsibility. And that's one of the biggest problems we have in marriages and in families today, is individuals not behaving responsibly. Husbands not being responsible, wives not behaving responsibly, even parents. That's a major problem with even parenting today. Parents not being responsible about the tarbi of their children. But Salah brings this sense of responsibility that becomes very beneficial in our other relationships. The second trait or quality that I'll talk about that is closely related with the first one, but I'd like to mention it separately. And that is Salah teaches a person, a believer, to the quality of selflessness. Selflessness. The ability to think, to put someone or something before yourself. That at Fajr time, like I said before, at Fajr time, I would rather sleep myself. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked me to pray. So I will stand up and pray. I will put Allah before my rest. At Dhuhr time, I would rather eat lunch or get my work done. But I will put Allah first and I will pray. At Asr time, I would rather get home. But I will put Allah first and pray Asr. Maghrib time, I would much rather watch the game. But I will put Allah first and pray Maghrib. At Isha time, I would rather eat dinner or go to sleep. But I will put Allah in my prayer and my Salah first. And I will pray Salat al-Isha. Similarly, when you have in marriage, this is a key, this is a necessary component of marriage. When you have a husband and wife, and each one thinks of themselves, puts their own needs, their own desires before the relationship or before the other, it literally rips and pulls them apart. But when you have two individuals, when you have a husband and a wife, 
who each are invested into the well-being of the other before their own well-being, they put the other before themselves, then it pulls them together until they can truly become one, as it was meant to be. Salah brings about this quality. The third quality I'll mention here. Salah teaches us humility. The ability to be humble, to humble ourselves. And that is self-explanatory. Because you see, it doesn't matter who you are, how wealthy you are, how famous you are, how handsome or beautiful you are, how educated you are. It doesn't matter who you are and what you have and what, what, what you possess. When we stand up and we pray right now, Salatul Jumu'ah, and when we say Allahu Akbar and go into sujood, each and every single one of us will put our face on the ground. Where a minute ago somebody was putting their feet, I will put my face there and humble myself and remind myself of what my reality is, where I came from and where I'm going back to. Salah reminds us five times a day we humble ourselves to instill humility within ourselves and to make any relationship successful, especially a family, a home. Humility is necessary. Arrogance, it breaks the hearts. Arrogance, it breaks the hearts. Humility, it joins and brings the hearts together. <coughs> the fourth and the final quality I'll mention here is Salah teaches us the ability to forgive. It trains us in the ability to forgive. How so? You see, when we stand up and when we pray Salah, when we offer our prayers, we beg and we plead and we cry and we ask Allah to forgive us for what we've done. Allahumma inni zalamtu nafsi dhulman kathira. Oh Allah, I've messed up a lot. Wala yaghfiru dhunuba illa ta. Oh Allah, no one can forgive except for you. Faghfir li maghfirata min indik. So Allah, please forgive me as a favor from you. Warhamni, have mercy on me, O Allah. Please, I beg you. Innaka antil ghafur rahim. Because you and only you are the constantly forgiving and constantly merciful. I beg and I plead and I cry before Allah. Oh Allah, please forgive me. But the Prophet ﷺ taught us a very valuable principle to live by. مَنْ لَا يَرْحَمْ لَا يُرْحَمْ Someone who does not show mercy, extend mercy to others, is not worthy, not deserving of being shown any mercy. And when we apply that same principle, we understand that what makes me feel so entitled? What makes me feel so entitled? to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. Why do I think I am worthy and deserving of Allah's forgiveness when I am not willing to forgive the people that are nearest and dearest to me? When I cannot forgive my own family members, my own wife, my own brother, my own sister, my own children, for little, little, small, little things. I cannot practice forgiveness or mercy. What makes me so confident in asking for Allah's forgiveness and mercy? Salah trains us to forgive, because when we stand up and when we sit down and when we put our head on the ground and we beg Allah for forgiveness, it reminds us to also be forgiving in our own personal lives. These are just a few of the qualities that we learn, that we can benefit from, that we can grow in terms of when we are regular, when we are punctual about our salah. These are some of the side benefits of prayer that we must be conscious of and that Allah brings our attention to when He says, حَافِظُوا عَلَى الصَّلَوَاتِ وَالصَّلَاةِ الْوُسْطَى When He's talking about a family that is going through issues and problems because Allah says that the remedy of your problems lies in that same prayer. That you don't quite understand the significance of. But this leads to a question. A very obvious question. And that's, brother, you know, I've been praying for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. I've been praying. I pray five times a day for 20 years. I have yet to see these benefits that you talk about. I don't see these benefits. I don't see these qualities or traits in my life. Even though I do pray. What's, what's going on? What's missing? What's missing is that one key ingredient. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam refers to as khushu. It's the quality, the key ingredient of khushu. Which... To not get into a technical discussion of what khushu means, I will summarize, not translate, I will summarize the meaning of khushu as quality within the prayer. You see, for the prayer to deliver its benefits, 
we have to add the key ingredient of quality within our prayers. Unless and until our prayers will have quality, we won't benefit from them properly. But that leads to the follow-up question, and probably the most important question, and that is, how do I get quality within my prayers? How do I achieve quality within my salawat, within my prayers? Khushu' in my salawat. How do I get that? There's a longer discussion about this. Inshallah, later today, after Salat al-Isha, 7.30 p.m. Inshallah, I'll be giving a more detailed lecture here tonight at the Masjid, Inshallah, Masjid al-Salam, talking about in more detail how to develop quality and khushu within our salawat. And I encourage you to come back, Inshallah, for the evening lecture so we can have a more in-depth discussion about how to develop khushu in our salawat. But I will share this much with you. The most important factor, the key ingredient to adding quality and khushu to our prayers is to understand what we read, what we say within our prayers. I always give this very ridiculous, silly, preposterous example. And I give this example because it delivers that effect. Because of how silly it is. I've been standing in front of you talking to you for 25 minutes. The hope, or at least I hope that the vast majority of you have been paying attention. And if you've been paying attention, there's a very simple reason and a cause for why you're paying attention to what I'm saying. Why I am in, in, in passionate about what I'm saying, why, I'm, I, why I am interested in this discussion, and why you are also paying attention and taking part. And that is because not only do I understand what I'm saying, but you also understand the words that I'm speaking. I'm speaking a common language. I'm speaking English, which I understand the words that I'm speaking, and you understand the words that I'm speaking. <coughs> But imagine for the last 25 minutes if I've been standing in front of you speaking in a foreign language that forget about you, I myself don't even comprehend. I've been standing in front of you reading a sheet of paper in German or French or Chinese. I don't understand that language and neither do you. How long before you would lose interest in what I was saying? You would lose focus in what I was saying? Almost immediately. How long before I would become disinterested in my own discussion? Because I'm just reading. I don't understand what I'm saying. Almost immediately, within minutes. Now this part stings just a little, and I apologize if I offend someone. As ridiculous and silly as that example is, why would somebody stand here for 25 minutes and speak in a foreign language? Then nobody understands. As silly as that example is, compare our salawat and our prayers to that. How different are our prayers from that silly example? We stand in salah, prayer after prayer, day after day. And we read, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa tabaraka smuka wa ta'ala Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Subhana rabbil al-Azim Rabbana wa laka alhamdu hamdan kathira wa At-tahiyyatu lillahi wa sallam We read throughout our prayers. Do we understand what we're saying? Do we truly, deeply, profoundly, properly understand what we're reading and what we're saying? If we don't, then we see we have found the cause and the root of our problem right there. That's why we lack proper focus. That's why we lack the concentration within our prayers. We have to begin to understand what we read and what we say within our prayers. And so to conclude, I wanted to announce um, the purpose of my own visit and this discussion that we're engaging in that we're going to continue inshallah later tonight at 7.30 p.m. This is in connection with a course that I'll be teaching here at your masjid um, during the month of February, February 10 through 12th. The second weekend of February inshallah. I'll be teaching a course here at your masjid titled Meaningful Prayer, The Linguistic Beauty of Salah. In that course, we will go through the meaning of the entire prayer. Like we covered half wudu ala salawat, understood in depth what that what those three words mean. We will go through every single word in the prayer. From takbir Allahu Akbar, opening supplications, a'udhu billah, bismillah, surah al-fatiha, another portion of the Qur'an. What we say in ruku, what we say in sujood, what do we say when we get up from ruku, what do we say between the sujood, the sitting portion of prayer, and even extra parts of the prayer, like the supplication of qurut and the supplication of istikhara. We will cover all of that in one weekend here at your own masjid. So inshallah, I encourage again everyone to come join us again in the evening to continue this discussion. But if for whatever reason you cannot, 
at least, inshallah, take home the intention to join us on Friday, February the 10th, inshallah, at 7 p.m. here at your masjid, Masjid al salam where we will embark on this journey of understanding intricately, in detail, each and every single word we read and recite within our salawat and our prayer, and our hope, inshallah, is that by understanding those words and gaining the ability to reflect and think and ponder on what we're saying within our prayers, we will begin to develop focus, quality, khushu within our salawat. بارك الله لنا ولكم في القرآن العظيم ونفعني وياكم بالآيات والذكر الحكيم استغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم